That's very, very beautiful. You are a deeply spiritual human being. I've seen that um, the times that I've had the pleasure and honor to be around you. Uh, one time was at Arcadia and where you gave this rising, rousing speech, which was uh, very, very memorable for me. It had a huge impact on my life. And for that, I, I thank you. No, I remember it at all. So you had a better experience than I did. <laughs> 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 we'll leave that there. <laughs> and um, it was uh, afterwards when we were sitting, you know, with Aubrey and others that I really got to feel your your heart and how you express yourself and how genuine and authentic you truly are. And you are someone who literally wears like <laughs> it's it's not an armor. <clears throat> it's completely penetrable. You wear your heart all over you, not just on your sleeve. And I think that's one of the, the greatest examples of what it means to be a human being that I've ever seen embodied in someone. So that's a, a very, very deep compliment mm. for me to give to you. And it's such an honor to be here with you. But I'm sure that along your journey, you must have had major turning points. And I'm also sure that you probably, especially coming from three board certified subspecialties along your journey you must have gotten some pushback uh, from those specialties and the friends and colleagues that you probably had in those specialties when you went through your life change can you tell us a little bit about what happened then yeah i mean those stories are so many and it was, was a long and winding past so it's too much to recount in a podcast i suppose but um you know, uh, try to, trying to distill down a couple of those. Uh, first of all, you know, just for everybody listening, you know, you guys are all living such revolutionary lives. Nobody stepped into this moment of being a finite being to to have an easy go of it. I mean, every, everybody picked the pressure cooker moment of human history to we show chose up it. right now. We chose this. And, and the manifestation of being in this space is is potent and it's blessed. I mean, that that we are the 8 billion that got chosen for this moment. I believe there's probably many more, more infinite beings or infinite realities that tried to be here right now. You know, because it is the most interesting thing happening. It's, in the, it's the best ticket in the universe, right? It's so <laughs> fascinating what's it happening is. on this planet right, right now because <laughs> it will change everything. For light or dark, it will change everything. And so we are blessed to be here. The Achilles heel of my journey was not the... Not the naysayers of colleagues and, you know, family members and everything else that will come into your life to say you're crazy or you're on the wrong path or you're mm -hmm. making bad decisions the the thing that most limited the smoothness of my journey created the most extreme turbulence in my journey was my own doubt of self and the universe is relentlessly wearing that down and so if you feel your journey is really tiring and exhausting and there's so much friction and everybody's trying to stop you that is freaking you <laughs> like we are creating that it's a yeah. condition for ourselves mm -hmm. And so the turning points that I look back on were all surrender moments. And when I say surrender, that is finally the moment where I stop being my own problem and stop being my own biggest naysayer or, you know, opponent in, in life. When you are finally so broken and so exhausted, so out of energy to maintain the stories that you're telling yourself, then you finally have the breakthrough. And I had to come to that many, many, many times, including in the last five days. I'm constantly hitting another threshold of possibility of surrender. And, you know, there's... It, it, many times over the last decade as these have accelerated so much so that I'm just, I can feel the next one coming. I have a PTSD over these moments now where I, I, I pre, I, I perceive mm -hmm. the exhaustion that I'm about to go through. And I'm mm -hmm. like, Oh my God, I don't think I can actually survive it. I think this one will undo me completely and I will just dissipate. 
there's a, there's something I get to see under the microscope all the time in my biotech lab called apoptosis, and it was my area of specialty in mitochondrial metabolism when I was back in chemotherapy development days of my career. But apoptosis is such an interesting thing. It's it's when a a mitochondria a bacteria living inside of a human cell realizes that human cell is no longer contributing to the greater whole. And the mitochondria flips a switch through this little protein that I was an expert in Coop TF1 and that was my little protein expertise. And <laughs> Coop TF1 flips and holy cow, the whole mitochondrial cascade suddenly triggers this apoptosis cell suicide event. And the human cell, which is thousands of times larger than a mitochondria, the whole human cell responding to that little signal from that little bacteria living inside that human cell says, ah, it's time for me to disappear. And the cell literally under a microscope over the next minutes and hours, and usually takes about 48, 72 hours for a cell to completely move through this journey. Uh, At least that was the dogma I was trained in. Now I've found out and seen under a microscope that it can actually happen logarithmically faster than that. But Nonetheless, it's it's at a slow enough rate that it's very easy to observe under a light microscope. The whole cell turns into like this effervescent, you know, it looks like you know CO2 bubbles in your in your gas water or something like that, like your sparkling water effect, where the the cell, which moments ago looked completely solid, suddenly turns into all these tiny tiny bubbles and then just dissipates quietly. It doesn't require an immune system. It doesn't require an immune cell. It doesn't require in, in, require inflammation. It just simply dissolves into into the ethers. No no trace of it left within just you know, minutes to hours. I think we do that apoptosis thing when we are at our best. When I'm at my best, I'm willing to surrender at the level that I'm willing to let everything that I have worked my entire life and maybe lifetimes for dissolve immediately and completely dissipate into nothing. And that's a terrifying thing. The first time that happened was, you know, probably the first time I remember it happening was was when I was 18. And that event led to me deciding to go to the Philippines and birth babies and the whole life changed. But it was a, a moment of deep heartbreak and my heartbreak you know I blamed on a girlfriend but it really was my heartbreak that I had so disrespected myself that I was willing to do that relationship Mm -hmm. it was my first relationship that I ever had and it went against all of my natural instincts for what I deserved and what I wanted and what I was you know Mm -hmm. holding myself for and so my heartbreak wasn't over the girlfriend my heartbreak was over my own lack of self-love that I would have done that to myself and it took me years to figure out that that's why I was so deeply wounded by this experience because it didn't make sense because it was just a short little relationship and you're a kid and what the heck but in hindsight my gosh was i heartbroken for myself that i would so not care better for myself that i would allow that that to be a first relationship and as i've journeyed through life i find that again and again Boy, the world builds us up to this point where we're so afraid to let go of the thing that we've built. And and says, so like, well, I've poured all this time and effort and all this in. And one of those, of course, was when I decided to finally leave academia in 2010. I was terrified because I knew for a good six months that this was going to be the decision, you know, mm-hmm. deep down. But my brain was not letting me go there, you know, mm-hmm. and everything was resisting this. And man, you know, I'd spent 17 years in academia. I'd had a whole house mortgage worth of school debt and my kids were growing up quick and we're heading towards college and they were going to have school debt on top of mine. And, and I was making $75,000 a year as an academic professor. And it's like, you just got nothing. Like you can't, you're insoluble financially. You're out of energy because you've been working 100, 120 hours a week for, you know, years and you're just flat out freaking exhausted and then the world, you know, or your deeper, higher self says, all of that, it was not the thing. You got to let it go now. Just let it go. Bubble tea. You know, just mm-hmm. let that thing dissolve into effervescence. And the terror, the I mean, the gnashing of teeth and just like the anger at, at the divine and God and cosmos and myself, the whole thing. And so it's just, you know, I, I think I'm trying to paint <laughs> brush strokes here of a life of resistance against the possibility that it could be more beautiful than I can possibly imagine. 
Oh. That's all I'm resisting. Wow. So you're resisting confronting the possibility that life could be more beautiful than you could possibly imagine. Why is that scary? It's frightening because the world has set our value system and the metrics for value on that which we can build. And if the real world that I live in, the real reality behind the, the, the stained glass is more beautiful than I can possibly imagine, then it means I didn't fucking build a thing. And that's the wound that I carry, is that then I must not be valuable. Mm. If it is more beautiful than I can imagine, then why am I here? What, what am I contributing 